Hey, hey, Warrior Saints. Welcome to St. George, the birthplace of the Warrior Saint movement where we unleash greatness by living a crucifixional life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Kobani. Kobani is a small village on the Syro-Turkish border, on the border of Syria and Turkey. And it was under siege for many years uh, under the thumb of ISIS. And the cruelty of ISIS, the cruelty of those those people, those fighters there at that time in the past few years was, I mean, indescribable, indescribable. Recently, after their liberation, many of the people who were Muslim in that village have converted to Christianity. And the reason they said this, they said the reason was because if, if that is Islam, we don't want any part of it. One of them even said, I would rather be in hell than be with, in paradise with them even if it's paradise, right? I mean, so you could see how awful the treatment must have been. Fascinating in the article that I read about this and, and as it was detailing this was that they didn't want to, they didn't want to give their names. The priest of the, the Christian church that, grew, that was uh, be, uh, being born there in this village of Kobani and many of the, the Christians who had converted from Islam did not want their last names or did not want their names at all said because they were afraid. They were afraid of ostracization, meaning their family would kick them out or no longer speak to them or remove them from their ranks. And also that the family, <coughs> excuse me, that they might even lose their lives. Because as we know, in some, in some circles, uh, it, it's, it's forbidden to leave Islam and, and become a Christian, especially Christianity. And so their lives could be taken. And yet in spite of their fear, they did what they knew to be right. In spite of the, the, the dread that they must have had, the fear that maybe ISIS would come back, or that some of their, their horrible teachings might still infiltrate the people of the village of Kobani, and they might do to us what, they, what ISIS was doing before. In spite of that fear, they did what was right, because they knew that somehow God had put something inside of them. They had been called and recognized the faith of Christ. And even in spite of their fear, they acted with great bravery, doing the right thing. This morning's gospel from chapter 25 of the gospel of Matthew is about a landowner, a rich merchant, and he's going away on a trip somewhere. And he's got three servants that he gives some money to. So now keep in mind, we know this story, we just heard it. There are five talents that he gives to one, three talents, I'm sorry, five talents that he gives to number one, two talents that he gives to the second, and one talent that he gives to the first. So just to give us a little context, the talent, this, this monetary unit, would, it would probably be equivalent to about 15 years of wages for the laborer. So he was giving this guy 15 years worth of money, of his salary. Do you understand that? 15 years worth. Well, times five, times two, and times one. Do you understand? I.e. a considerable amount of money. Now the first guy went immediately. I love it how it says it. Immediately he took what he was given and he went and he worked. And he traded. And he worked some more and he traded some more. And by the time the master came back, he doubled it. He had taken the gift that he had been given, worked hard with it, and doubled his master's money. The other guy, the second guy, did the same thing. He didn't have as much. He only had two talents. So about 30 years worth of, of salary. And he went right away and traded and worked and traded and worked. And he doubled his master's money. And when the master came back, he said, look, now you have four. You had two, now you have four. The last guy, he's the interesting one. Because he obviously wasn't given too much. I mean, 15 years worth of salary is a lot of money for sure. But not in comparison to the others. He wasn't given too much. But he was afraid. He was afraid of messing up, of failing of what others might say about him. He was afraid of taking the gift that the master had given to him and not doing right with it. So what did he do? What did he do with it? Nothing. That's the whole point. He took it and stuck it in the ground where no one could find it and nothing could happen from it. This gift that he was given in, 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 with instruction to go and, and, and make fruit of this, he did nothing with it because he was afraid. And he even said it when the master comes back and kind of gets ticked off at him a little bit. He says, well, I know you're an angry man. And you take money where there's none of yours to be taken. And you're just you, 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 excuse, excuse, excuse. It's all you. So you know what I did? I hit it. Hey, here you go. You gave me this. I give it back. I didn't, I didn't grow it. I didn't increase it. I didn't make it better. I, di I didn't lose anything. 
I was afraid of that. I was afraid you might chop my head if I did that. So you, you, you get back what you gave me in the start. The master didn't seem to like that, did he? <laughs> he didn't like that. He calls him a wicked servant. And he takes this talent, this 15 years worth of wages that he had given this guy to work with, and he says, give it to the other guy. Give it to the first guy who had five and made 10. Give it to him. And this guy casts him out because he's worth it. His fear led him to inaction and the master of that house wanted action, right? And all of this beautiful story, he says, or Matthew tells us in, the, in this gospel, chapter 25, it's to tell us something. You see, in that story, we have the option to put ourselves in the position of any one of those three servants. You can't be the master. You cannot be, the, you're not God. I'm not God, none of us are God. So we can, we can remove the master from the, our position in the story. So who's left? Number one, number two, or number three. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, who am I? Am I going to be like number one or two? Or am I going to be like number three and be cast off? You see, all of us have been given gifts by God. It's a fabulous part of the story. That the master in this story, he gives them his own money. He doesn't take some of their money. He doesn't go sell something. He gives them his own money. God gives us our own gifts, gifts that are from Him, the image that is from Him, to chase the likeness that is from Him. God gives us all things, all gifts that we need. Now, they're not all the same. Some of you are smarter than others. Some of you are better looking than others. Some of you are stronger than others. Some of you are younger or older than others. Each and every one of us have different gifts. We may excel here and not excel there. And I may not excel here, but I do over there. And so God has given to each of us very, very special gifts. And as I know you all, I look and think, I know what your gifts are, your gifts and your skills. I think I know what my gifts and skills are. The question is now that they have been given to us, what do we do with them? Do we stick them in the ground and not nurture them? Or do we take the gifts that God has given us and make them grow? And I'm not talking about financial gifts, and I'm not talking about stuff. If you have that, awesome, great, good for you. But I think we're talking about something a little bit deeper inside the gifts that God has given us, the love that he has given to us to share with the world, the strength, the ferocity, the crucifixional nature of humanity that he has given to us that we might nurture, help it grow, double it, if you will. Do we always do that? I mean, if you're like me, the answer is no, you don't always do that, right? Why do we not do that? Because we're afraid. We're afraid. You see, notwithstanding physical safety, set aside actual physical safety, what are the reasons that we are afraid? What makes people be afraid to do something, to accomplish something anyways in life? Really, as I see it, there are three big ones. The first being fear of what other people think, fear of what other people might say. The second is the fear of failure. What if what I do doesn't work? What if I try something and it flops? And the third is that, oh, it might be really hard. I don't know that I want to do all the work that's, that's connected to this success. And so we allow one of these three fears to box us in to inaction. And we become like number three, who buried his talent in the ground and did not produce fruit. But the master, as we saw, did not like that. He is begging us. He is calling us to take the gifts that we have, those gifts that are unique to each and every one of you, and to use them and multiply them so that you might offer back unto the Lord, so that you might take what he gave you and make it more, not for his sake, for he needs it not, but for our sake and for the sake of the world. And so today, our practical point, I just want to deal with number one of those three fears, what other people might say. You know, it's, a, it's a, a common, really it's an essential aspect of humanity, of human beings. We want to relate. We want to connect. We want to have community. That's, you know, the church, the word church itself, the actual term church, literally means a gathering, an assembly, a community. We need that. We need other people. We want other people to affirm us, to tell us we have value, to say, I hear you, I see you. You matter. We need that. It's in us. It's intrinsic. You can't escape that. That's why when man is, a man or a woman is left alone on an island, they will go insane. 
because we need other people to affirm us. And sometimes that fear is, what if they don't affirm us? What if they say what I'm doing isn't good? What if they say what I'm doing is dumb? <laughs> right? What if, what if they make fun of me? And that fear leads us to in and act, to inaction. And this is exactly what Matthew is telling us today in the gospel, what our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is saying. No inaction. I gave you gifts. Go make them multiply. And so we have to be mindful that this fear of what other people think and what other people say is something that can be debilitating, but we must triumph over. And the first thing, the first part of all that is to remember. Look, I've been a priest 20 years. I learned this. I learned it a long time ago, but now I'm like comfortable with it. You want haters. You want people criticizing you. You want people making fun of you. You want people saying that what you're doing is wrong. Do you know why? Because that means what you're doing is right. I'm not talking about wickedness. Use your brains. You, you guys can do that. I'm saying that when people criticize you, people take shots at you, it's because you have done something that has made them uncomfortable. You have done something that has said to them, I want to do that. Why am I not doing that? Why is he doing that? Why is she doing that? I should be doing that. Well, I'm not. Therefore, I will criticize. Right? When you have haters, it means you're on to something. And so I say, don't get rid of the haters. Go get some more. If you have 10, you need 20. Right? People will criticize you. People will make fun of you 99% of the time because they are jealous, afraid, and ashamed of themselves for not doing, not being as courageous, and not taking the steps forward that you are. I'm not, causing, I'm not asking you to cause strife. I'm not causing, telling you to go fight with people. But don't be afraid of people criticizing you. Don't be afraid of people saying, what are you doing, right? Look, look, beloved, listen, listen, listen. Here are the words I'm about to give. I'm going to give you a pearl right now. People don't ever, ever, ever say what they mean. There's always subterfuge in the it's subtext to what they're saying. They never say what they mean. So when they're criticizing you, what I'm telling you as your father in Christ who loves you is that they're saying jealous. So go get yourself some haters. Don't be rotten, but go get yourself some haters and don't be afraid of them. Right? The second thing. When people criticize us or make fun of what we're doing or speak ill against us, it very often can lead us, as we say, to inaction. And our fear is of not pleasing another person. That somehow if they speak against me or criticize me, they no longer love me. Right? Now look, I've been married for more than 20 years. I know for, for truth that just because you're criticized doesn't mean you're not loved. Right? Just because you are criticized doesn't mean you are not loved. My bride keeps me in line. If I'm anything, it's because of her. Really. God, for sure. But if I'm anything, it's because of her. And she is so good to tell me when I'm wrong. So good to correct my mistakes and keep me in line. But I know that when she criticizes my, my thoughts or actions or behavior, she doesn't say, oh, and by the way, I also hate you. In fact, it's quite the opposite. She says, maybe not even out loud, but I know, I'm telling you these things because I love you. If I didn't love you, I'd let you flop. I'd let you do these things and make a mess of life and say, oh, nice job, you know. But because I love you, I want to offer this correction. I want to offer this advice. I want to offer this guidance, this loving corrective. And if I'm smart, and I'm not always smart, but sometimes I am, I say, hey, listen to her. Listen to this criticism. Listen to this critique. Because when given with love, it will make you better. It will make you more like servant number one and not servant number three, right? So second, listen to those critiques. And sometimes, some people just are plain old rotten. And because of their own fears that we talked about a minute ago, they'll criticize you and make fun of you just to make themselves feel better. But it doesn't necessarily mean that their critiques are wrong. Right? It doesn't mean that they're wrong. Be a wise man and a wise woman and listen to the critiques of others. Examine yourself and what you're doing because you might find a pearl in there that leads you, in spite of the malintent from which it comes, that might lead you to drawing ever closer to Christ our God. And the third part about it, the third thing to take confidence in when people are criticizing you and making fun of your efforts and your challenges to draw nearer to Christ. You know, if you have ever been in a church or ever opened a Bible or read a Bible, you will know that before our Lord and Savior himself went to the cross, 
before Christ was crucified and raised from the dead for our salvation, he was mocked. He was punished unjustly. He was beaten unnecessarily. And he was made fun of, spit at, slapped, beaten, struck. When we, as Christ, Christ tells us very clearly, look, I'm the Lord, I'm the master. If they do it to me, do you not think they will also do it to you? Is the servant greater than the master? That's what Christ asks his disciples, his apostles. And so he's telling us that, look, when we are facing those types of at persecution, maybe too strong a word, but let's just go with it because let's just go with it for today. When we're facing those persecutions, when people are criticizing or making fun or laughing about the efforts that we're putting forward, it is then and perhaps only then that we are like Christ. You see, I can't walk on water, I can't raise the dead, I can't turn water into wine, and I can't make bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. I can't do any of that stuff. Basically, all I can really do is sin. But if I suffer like Christ, if I carry my cross like Christ, if I live a crucifixional life, it's probably the only thing that I can do to be like Christ. And so take comfort, take refuge in the fact that when you face this type of criticism, when you face this type of persecution, it's not because somehow you're off track. Indeed, it's probably because you are right on track. Because they did that to our Lord, and they will do that to all who follow our Lord. And so as you go in life, you should expect to face that same type of persecution. Beloved in Christ, God has blessed you all richly. Indeed, he has blessed you richly. Maybe with material things, and hopefully without. Regardless of the blessings we have materially, we all have been given blessings inside, in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, in our guts, in our very core, to take those blessings, to take those gifts that God has given us and to multiply them, to turn them back towards God and to turn them loose on the world. There is, there are probably many, but for today there is one thing that is really trying to keep us from doing that and it is fear. We talked about all kinds of fear But most importantly, the fear of what other people will think. The fear of what other people will say. Do not, my beloved in Christ, let that fear lead you to inaction. But transcending that, following Christ, being crucifixional yourself in your own lives, stand up this very moment and go forward as a valiant soldier in the army of the Lord. A warrior saint. And be like servant number one and not like servant number three. May our great God and Savior Jesus Christ bless and keep you.